دایی یه فرصت خوب حالا پشت مدفع خدا داد عزیزی توی دروازه گل گل برای ایران خدا داد عزیزی باز هم روی دمید گشت به سرداراز بود و توی دروازه سرداراز بود گل به نماز بود و برای ایران بزنه کریم اصلاری فرد گل توی دروازه Welcome back to Global Zan Podcast. My name's Ari Alaverdi. Glad to have you back with us. It's been a little while. Of course, if you didn't hear our last podcast, it was an interview with Arsalan Kazemi. Iran national basketball player. We also have a couple of interviews coming up very, very soon, so stay tuned for that. So we'll have part two of this podcast coming out next week where we'll have our own discussion about the transfers last season and this season and everything surrounding the Legionnaires. In the meantime, this podcast is going to be an episode regarding little interviews we did with journalists and experts from different countries that our Legionnaires play in. We'll be asking them about the Legionnaires, how they played last season, how they could play this season, about the transfers, and a lot more more than that as well be sure to check out our journalists and experts that we've interviewed we've got all their information in the description down below on the website as well so i hope you enjoyed the episode subscribe to us on youtube leave a like and rating on the podcast platform you're listening on force and it's a first time ball play through it's godos who makes it 2-1 and just like dervis ugly in the first half Sam Angodos gets off the mark. All right, I'm joined by David Anderson of Brentford FC Tactical. How are you doing, my friend? Hi there, buddy. Yeah, really good, are you? How are you doing? Yeah, all good. Thanks for coming on Global Zan Podcast. I appreciate the time. Um, of course, as I said, you're from Brentford FC Tactical. Can you just give us a little bit about your own, your own work, your own podcast? Yeah, of course. So um, Brentford FC B's Tactical Podcast has been going for a while, well, probably started during the pandemic, the, the early throes of the pandemic. Um, it was me and a couple of guys that we just decided that, yeah, we had a bit more time on our hands. We wanted to talk about Brentford um, and yeah, we just went for it. It's a tactics-based podcast, tactics, statistical analysis. Um, yeah, we, we just try and look at um, the sort of underlying stories behind Brentford. First of all, I've got to congratulate yourself. Um, obviously, commiserations, first of all, for the, for the Euros, but congratulations for the promotion to the premier league yeah it's a mixed um it's a mixed summer i mean yeah the the highs of brentford are not going to be dampened by england losing in a final from my perspective um i i was just impressed that uh, england got to the final i think i'd take that any day but yeah it, it's been a brilliant summer um Brentford, yeah, did the business. It's been a long time coming. I think it's been it's been on the cards for a while now. Um, it, the, the cherry on top would have been England winning uh, the Euros as well, which would have been insane to think about. But yeah, I, I think that was a stretch too far. And um, yeah, we, we got enough out of the summer. Fantastic. Um, all right. So we're here to speak about, of course, Brentford, but also about Samuel Godus, um, a player who joined Brentford last summer. He played this season in the championship relatively well, you could say. He didn't he didn't score that many goals, but he did play quite well. What were your impressions of of him? How did he fit into the system Brentford played? Um and yeah, how, how did you find his performance this season? Uh yeah, he was um I th- I think mixed in the beginning. Um there was a lot of hype around him coming. Uh there was quite a few off the field issues which needed to be resolved. Um but when he did arrive, there was lots of excitement around him because I think we were we just lost a player, or I'm not sure on the timings, but Saeed Ben Rama, probably quite well known. Um, physically, he's similar. Size, he's similar. And I think if you look at a lot of footage of Godos over the over the years, he's just a final third demon. And a lot of Brentford fans would have thought this is a like for like replacement for Ben Rama. So there was a lot of excitement around him. But when he arrived. Um, he hadn't played as much football, um, possibly carrying a little too much weight wide, a little bit stocky, Yeah, yeah not moving sure. across the turf quickly. Um, the, the English game's faster, the championship's intense, it's tough, it's rugged. And it's fair to say that he took a while to adjust. He looked a little bit like a, 
like a, just a bit off the pace and um, it was de- it was definitely noticeable like he, it was just clear that he um, needed to work on the other sides like his fitness and um, just getting up to speed so the excitement and the performances didn't really match up for a while and there was probably a little bit of stick going towards him like um, have the have we signed one of our first duds like we don't Brentford don't sign many dud players um, is this potentially one so there was there was mixed opinions on him I, I always saw the good points in him I, I wasn't one of those that doubted him actually I could see that there was a you, you could almost see what he was thinking you could see what he was doing it was just that he had this body physique which is a little bit like he's just um just a little bit stockier than your average like Wayne football. Rooney you could see yeah exactly like that exactly like Rooney like they're built in a certain way and they're they're fit guys they're just not this Adonis Cristiano Ronaldo shaped six foot four sorry six foot tall um body they just have a slightly different body shape so they are going to look a little bit weird on the eye when they're running maybe or when they're moving or when they're turning but once i i always knew that once he did get up to speed this would be a really really important player and um a very smart player as well you could you could see from his previous games that he was a yeah i I said early on like a final third demon just very sharp in the final third played all of the positions played like wide forward on the right wide forward on the left played as a central striker off the striker scored some outstanding goals and you you could just tell that once he got up to the speed and the way he strikes the ball and how clever he is around the box and getting into the box that he was always going to be fine but the interesting enough actually we'll probably go on to it but his actual positioning was a little bit deeper than what he's done previously but yeah yeah, we'll move on to that yeah i mean i think you guys were mentioning on your own podcast um and and if you haven't listened to that uh we, we actually shared it on our on our twitter feed um you guys were mentioning how you played as like a number eight they play a 4-3-3 Brentford, so they were playing him in a midfield three as one of the flanking um, midfielders. What was your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was, as I said to in the beginning, I think we thought he'd be coming in as a winger. That was my idea. And then the more you think about it, I, he isn't that explosive type of player that would play out wide. Effect. I mean, he's bit, he's looked like that in the past, but in this country, I think some of that explosion, what, what you see is... Um, dynamite movement and rapid movement in another league doesn't quite look as quick in England it looks a little bit slower it's a little bit nullified so it makes sense that he was actually going to be brought inside and try and get some of his ball playing ability some of his ball striking from the middle of the park like just moving up the field and and uh, what's what's really key about those um, two midfield eights the Brentford play like that um a bit of it like the inverted pyramid like you've got a single pivot and two eights who roam and connect with the wide players um those two midfielders need to be able to get into the box at times they need to be getting beyond the striker they need to be um getting into the half spaces putting in crosses they're very attack-minded players but they also have to defend well as well they have to defend um zonally and get back when we don't have the ball so it's a very energetic role and the better players you can get doing that the more likely you're going to have these two eights acting like tens because they'll be on the ball and they're getting forward so it's it, it makes sense to see him play there. I think he's got the tenacious, the appetite and the, the bite to be a little bit deeper and try and just take the sting out of games and control possession. And then he's also got the attacking stuff. So yeah. he, he's not quite a winger in um, in this country. I, I don't think that suits him. I think it's too... The, the, the right backs and left backs and full backs and wingers will probably gobble him up a little bit. I think that movement, smaller movement, intricate movement inside is a little bit more suited to him. So it, it makes sense that he go, he plays into that position the more you see him play. Yeah, I see him like an Iranian Iniesta. <laughs> <laughs> no, <fun>. no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so you got promoted this this obviously last season now we're going into the 2021 2022 season um in the Premier League now how does someone now fit in to that system going into the Premier League yeah it's it's interesting it's hard to know exactly I think where I'd come from is um Emiliano Marcondes is a player that played last season which we've let go he's gone to Bournemouth um I think the two of them are sort of fighting for similar positions and they dovetailed over the season um we had other midfield injuries Josh De Silva was injured for a long time from midway point um God has played he played an important role like supporting the first team I think he got I think he got 16 starts in the end um don't quote me on that but a lot of his minutes were coming on later in games closing out games um keeping us on top when we just need to keep that energy up um getting some goals when the games were tight as well like he scored goals at nil nil 
Um, not a massive goal scorer, but I think he got four together league and cup. He's he's definitely got a role. I I don't think it's from the start. I think Brentford are also in the move uh, moving for Frank Onyeka from Mityland, um, their sister club. Um, I think depend. I mean, it's it's the Premier League, isn't it? We could have in we could have an injury crisis in the first week, and we could find Godos starting a lot more games than we think. But my own opinion is he is just on that support act. Like he'll be he'll he'll play minutes from the bench, and I think he'll start the odd game here and there but I don't think he'll be that first team regular that I'm, I think you're probably trying to get out of me <laughs> and this is his first chance to kind of show himself on that platform on that stage so yeah you know we we, we as fans also would expect him not to be a starter more of a, a rotation player um at best so going into this season how do you think Brentford will do in the Premier League Oh wow! Yeah, we we spoke about this on um, an episode we we recorded not too long ago, the midfielders episode, I believe. We did a little Q and A afterwards. Um, yeah, I, I mean, anywhere above seventeenth is brilliant. Like a, another season in the Premier League is fantastic. But I think we might surprise a few people. I, I think we've got a settled squad. I think that looks when when there's continuity going up from the Championship into the Premier League, those teams tend to do better. Um, teams that are good at defending tend to do better as well. We're good at defending. Um, good sort of out of possession systems tend to fare better because you're just coming up against better quality opposition. And I, I, I think my instinct is we'll be around that. There'll, there'll be six clubs at the bottom that will be fighting. And I think we can finish above the bottom three. I'm, I'm going to say around that 16th, 15th mark. <laughs> I think, I, think, I think you're selling yourself a little bit short there. I do think Brentford are, are a good are a good footballing side. And I know they're not going to be the football inside they were in the championship, obviously, but I do feel like they have some really talented players who can maybe just push them a little bit closer to that 12, maybe 13, 14 spot. So we'll see. We'll see. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this season. I hope, I hope someone scores a free kick or something as well. <laughs> We'll see oh, me happens. too me too that'd be awesome wouldn't it he's scored a few in the past um he's still to get off the mark from free kick yeah. for brentford but yeah, yeah if he could if he could bury a couple this season that'd be great uh david i appreciate the time thanks for coming on uh make sure you check out um brentford fc tactical on on twitter and on spotify uh and yeah appreciate the time oh no problem at all um yeah keep an eye on salmon and um hopefully he has a great season we're all rooting for him on se zove Younes Delfi u 89. minuti na asistenciju Lovrića postavio 2-2. Delfi je i ranac, tek mu je 20 godina i pomoći će u napadu Gorice, sasvim sigurno. Okay, cool, I'm joined by Juraj Vodoyak. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. No, it's our pleasure. Before, before we move on, though, I guess it'd be really good to, I guess, reintroduce yourself to our listeners. Um, yeah, I'm Juraj Vrdoljak. I'm a full-time uh, I'm a full-time columnist for Telesport in Croatia, and you can also find me on various international media I've been writing on. So, yeah, pretty much um, doing full-time football work for um, for Telesport. So, we're going to talk about um, Iranian players in Croatia, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because obviously, we have we have two Iranian players playing. Uh, Sadek, Moharami and Yunus Delphi. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess if we start off with generally, how did, how did they both fare? Moharami played a lot more than Yunus Delphi. Obviously, he was injured. But I guess mm-hmm. how did you see how did you see Moharami's performance? Well, um, unfortunately, he wasn't really having any luck with his injuries. He had a good, rather good start at Dinamo Zagreb. He was somewhat a surprising addition to the squad. But considering the long um, tradition of uh, Croatian coaches in Iran, it perhaps isn't as surprising that um, he came on board. And uh, he really was, uh, he, he, he introduced himself quite well. I mean, his performance in the biggest Croatian derby, Dinamo Zagreb against Hajduk Split, he was really good in Dinamo Zagreb's win. But um, after that, he went through a major injury, unfortunately, and that kind of stopped his progress, I guess. Although um, the future does seem quite promising for him uh, at the moment. Yeah, I can certainly say since he's played more for, for Dinamo Zagreb, he's definitely improved himself from a national team perspective. He's, he's, his mm-hmm. performances have really got better and he's probably our first choice um, fullback now, I'd say. 
it's like going to the next season, how do you see his performance is going? How do you see kind of like, obviously he's playing in the Champions League also now. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you kind of see his performance in, into the next season? Well, most important thing uh, for Sadeg is that actually Dinamo um, sold, I mean, loaned, but with the, the option to buy uh, their uh, right back, Petar Stojanovic, who's been underperforming for some time now. So he decided to change surroundings, went to Empoli in Serie A. Um, so it opened up space to be kind of a first rotational choice for Dinamo Zagreb, uh, which is important as they are competing on a couple of fronts. Um, most notably, they're um, going for the Champions League now, playing the qualifiers against Legia Warsaw. Uh, he's been on the bench at the game that ended one all in Zagreb um, this week. So uh, Stefan Ristovski, will, the Macedonian player, will be obviously first choice at right, right back. Um, Dinamo paid quite a large sum to bring him over from Sporting Lisbon. But uh, we can expect to see more of Moharami um, now that he's obviously chosen to be got back from his injury, which is the most important bit, but also uh, important for him that uh, coach Damir Krasnar chose him to be like the first alter alternative for Svistovsky. So he's definitely going to see more playing time. Hopefully the injury thing is behind him. Mm -hmm. um, and it will be quite interesting to see him because as I said, like it, it, you get the feeling that you wanted to see more from him uh, before mm -hmm. the injury prevented you from seeing him. For sure, for sure. And then quickly, obviously, Yunus Delphi was injured this season and mm -hmm. didn't feature for, for Goritska. Um, but he has extended his loan deal. So I guess, what is the sort of consensus in Croatia for him? Well, as far as Yunus goes, um, he's, he's quite a mystery still. He hasn't featured a lot for Gorica. Um it's interesting because he's young. He obviously has uh, talent. And the, the, the thing is with Delphi that um, he has, he still has to wait on what will the situation, how will the situation uh, regarding their best player, um, Christian Lovic, develop. Um, Christian Lovic is playing on the left wing and he's got it as best player by far. Um, he's really a, a big offensive threat coming, cutting in from the inside, from the flank. He has an amazing shot, and that's where that's the main reason, apart from injury, why Delphi didn't get pretty much any playing time at all. Mm. Um, because I think they see Delphi as an emergency in case Lowbridge leaves. That they, they have like um, they have like a choice on the left flank that could immediately. You know, get into the squad. He knows the squad. Obviously, he's been there for the past season. And um, if Lovic leaves, which is highly likely, so I think Yunus uh, Goritza, Goritza deciding to extend his loan. I think it's a good sign for him because um, they obviously count on him. Even though Goritza changed uh, two coaches in the past um, couple of months. Kronos Laurendulic likes to play on the break as well. And I think he might fit in his system in case Lovic leaves. Okay, fantastic. Well, okay, amazing. Thank you so much. It was great talking with you. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Nanu delivers the ball in. Oh, hello. Late drama. Medi Terebi, what a goal that is. Well, well, well. Chelsea aren't quite over the line. And what a way for Porto to pull a goal back. Wow, what a goal. I'm joined by Ricardo Silva, a former journalist, lives in Malta, but he is Portuguese. Ricardo, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thanks. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. No, it's absolutely our pleasure. I think before we before we go ahead with some of the questions, it would be great if you could like introduce yourself very quickly to our listeners. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm a former journalist and... Uh, like 10 years ago, I started my career as, as journalist. Then it went uh, to another pet, and now I'm working uh, as a strategist for a betting company. So that's why I'm based in Malta. Um, I think what would be great to talk about first is how did our players play last season for their clubs in the Portuguese league? So, of course, there's Mehdi Tarami, um, Ali Alipur, Abed Zadeh, um, Salmoni, and, and very briefly, Moran Lu. Yeah, his spell was uh, was very short. Um, so when uh, it looked like he was starting uh, to settle, 
uh, he moved away to, to Paris Poly. So really difficult to, to evaluate uh, his, uh, his performance because uh, he was uh, in a, a very solid team. Uh, Santa Clara did an amazing season. They have been doing an amazing recruitment. Uh, so it's really a shame that uh, he left the team uh, so early. He could have been uh, far more important than, uh, than he was. And uh, he could have been, could have had a, uh, a good impact uh, in the team because uh, they like the striker with his um, with his profile. So it was uh, a, a bit uh, of a shame. So it's a bit difficult to to evaluate his performance because he didn't have many minutes. And uh, yeah, Amir was uh, was very important for Maritim uh, again, uh, been uh, really solid. Um, so for a struggling team like uh, Maritim was uh, last season, he was uh, quite important in some matches. And yeah, he, nothing much to, to say about him. He was uh, solid. Uh, yeah, he did, did quite well. And this move to Ponferradina is maybe a step behind on his career. Yeah, in my opinion. I think I think the biggest player obviously is, is Medi Taremi in, in Porto. Obviously, uh, he was part of the team that, that went so far in the Champions League. Um, what is the sort of like general consensus in Portugal? What's the sort of general kind of like feel about about Medi Taremi? Yeah, last season it was uh, like a consensus like Taremi was the the best striker in the Portuguese league. Uh, the truth is, uh, you, both Sporting and Benfica didn't have uh, uh, great strikers, but uh, yeah, the impact Taremi had in Porto was was really good. Uh, so he was involved in forty one goals out of 48 matches, so it speaks uh, a lot of uh, the impact he had in, uh, in Porto. That's brilliant, yeah. I'd love to talk about the two goalkeepers recently that have joined Port the Portuguese league. So, Ayer is a bear on band, which is probably our, our number one goalkeeper, and Niaz Mand as well. So, how do you think they'll help their teams? Why do you think they've been attracted to to these two teams? Well, in the uh, Ben Ravant case, uh, he should be... He was signed to be to be a regular starter, uh, and I believe he, he shouldn't have uh, many problems because their main goalkeeper left Lea Jardim back to Lille, uh, and uh, he should uh, he should start and should be a really good signing. Um, and I expect him to to have a, a big role in Bovista because uh, this season they lost a lot of players uh, like Paulinho, Twal Shabab, Non Santos, and the the, the loan Angel Gomes uh, show as well to back to Lille. They lost a lot of players. They look, uh, they look not pre not very prepared for this season. Uh, the squad still need uh, some players, but so when Ravand uh, impact uh, really need to to have an impact in this team. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, they should be a, a relegation contender. How things uh, look uh, look like at the moment. And what do you what do you think of, of Neos man obviously joining uh, Porto Mens? Yeah, it's a nice move, but uh, he should have more problems uh, because uh, Porto Mens have uh, three keepers already. Uh, Samuel Portugal had an amazing season uh, last uh, last season, uh, and they also have Ricardo Ferreira, who is uh, who is a long servant uh, of the team. Is there like uh, almost ten years since uh, season 13, 14, if I'm not wrong? And uh, even Kozuke Nakamura is there. He's uh, an international Japanese uh, who, who didn't have uh, any minutes. So I'm not sure um, if uh, Niazman will have uh, many opportunities, at least uh, during the, the beginning of the season. Obviously, there's been a lot of players, a lot of Iranian players linked with the Portuguese league, such as, you know, Mohamed Mohebi, Mehdi Ghaidi is doing so well in Estegal, um, Sosan Hosseini and Yasin Salmani, and I, I'm sure, you know, others in the future. Why do you think the Portuguese league is such an attractive league for, for both Iranians and, I guess, wider as well? Yeah, I think uh, first, uh, first thing is... Uh... The, the quality of the players, then the the price of the players. You know, uh, Portuguese teams, most of them are struggle, struggling with financial, financially. So, Iranian players are uh, really a good value for the for the money. So you see, Taremi came on a free transfer, and now his uh, his uh, transfer market value is sixteen millions. So, which is more close to to his uh, real value 
than like the the million he he was evaluated when back in Persepolis. So from this per perspective, it's uh, it's uh, really great deals for for Portuguese teams. That's amazing. I'd I'd love personally. I'd love to see Medi Raidi in in the Portuguese league. I think it'd be really exciting exciting move for him. Um, yeah, for sure. Perspective. Him and yeah. Salmani, I'm uh, I'm really really looking forward to to see him soon in Portugal. So Ricardo, uh, what about what about Ali Ali Poor? What do you think of him? Yeah, Ali Ali Poor uh, had a slow start to the season. Uh, he he didn't have uh, uh, luck with the the coach who started the season, who was uh, Lito Vidigal. He's a very conservative coach, so he he started the season uh, playing uh, mainly the the players who who he had trust. Uh, so after he was sacked uh, with the new coach Julio Velasquez, um, Ali Alipur benefited from uh, from some players injured, like uh, Rodrigo Pinho and uh, Tago, who were uh, injured, and he, he could uh, could have uh, important minutes. And he was uh, a key player in the uh, in the last nine rounds, where he scored two goals and uh, had an, one assist. That uh, that meant uh, nine points, very important for the. For Maritimo to stay in league. So this season, Rodrigo Pinho left to Benfica. Uh, so ahead of him, only Togo. So I expect him to, to have a, a bigger impact this season, even in a team that uh, had a, a huge turnaround. So 16 players were out, one of them, Amir. Uh, so I, I expect him to, to be a more important player this season for Maritimo. That's great to hear. And and lastly, about Jafar Salmani, what do you what do you make of his performance? Well, he, he didn't play much. Uh, Portimonense struggled a lot again last season, uh, and uh, but his vers versatility should help him a bit this season because Portimonense should uh, should play in three four three and and four three three. Uh, so his versatility as wing back or left winger should uh, should help him getting some minutes. Thank you so much, Ricardo Silva. It's been amazing talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Asari Fart, net two goals made to last season. Three to goal for the Asari Fart. Zero one provided by the United States Olympics. The Asari Fart goal, fantastic. Okay, I'm joined by Greg Gavalas uh, in Australia, who covers Greek football. Greg, how you doing, my friend? Are you very good yourself? Yeah, perfect. Just speak to us a little bit about yourself, about your own background. Sure. Uh, I uh, have studied journalism in Australia many years ago. I was uh, an editor for the Australian uh, International Soccer Weekly, uh, which is a, a newspaper slash magazine that was uh, quite popular in Australia. And then with the digital world coming in, I've uh, moved to Hellas Football, uh, where we cover everything Greek football, from club, uh, club teams to the national team and everything else around Greek football. Uh, so I've been doing that for a long time and I've been in, in di different digital Greek football services which cover Greek football in uh, English, which um, uh, you don't get, you know, once upon a time was impossible to get, but nowadays we do some pretty good coverage around that. So you can get a lot of um, your Greek football uh, in in English through through Hellas Football. Okay, so we have one player playing in uh, Greek uh, league just now, Kani Mansarifard, playing for AEK Athens, uh, played last season. Um also played in the Europa League. How did they do? Karim uh, was a huge signing for AEK last year. Um, AEK has had uh, that we won the championship in 2018, but we've had a lot of challenging seasons since then. Um, but when he got, he was one of the he was probably the the star signing uh, last season. He started off in the best way possible. He scored a, a, a Europa League in the Europa League qualifiers, the winning goal against the German club Wolfsburg. Um, and we were, we we're all very excited. I mean, his his reputation, especially from his time as Olympia at Olympia Kos, um, is of a great player because uh, Karim has got a huge amount of skill, and he can finish. And he proved that last season. He was uh, he was really good. He um, uh, he scored uh, thirteen goals, um, and uh, uh, we, we we loved every minute of it. Um, he had a little bit of competition from Oliveira, but he pretty much became the starting player for Ajax. Uh, as a team overall, we finished third uh, overall. Uh, it was very similar season to what we've done in the last couple of seasons since winning the championship. Um, you know, di a distant third to first and second. So we're really hoping um, this year uh, Karim and Ayek can uh, uh, get closer to the top two teams and um, 
Karim's going to have some competition this year because we brought in a new striker called uh, Sergio Araujo, who um, used to be at AIC for uh, on loan a few times beforehand, uh, but he's been bought permanently now, so he'll be partnering Karim. And uh, with the formation that we're using, it looks like it's going to be one striker, which, uh, which I don't know if it's going to work out the best, but it's going to be a good competition for Karim and for Sergio. And of course, the other signing for AUK Athens is a national team captain, Eson Hoysafi, who previously played for Panionios and Olympiakos, uh, of course, was teammates of Ansari Fard. They're good friends from, from childhood. And that's probably one of the reasons why he wants to join that club this season uh, from Sepahan. So how do you think he'll fit into the system this season? Eric has, um, has been looking for a new permanent left back with some pedigree for some time. Um, so I know uh, he can also play in the midfield as well. Um, I envision him to initially start at left back uh, and cement a position there. Um, look, we, we've, we have had a pretty ordinary start to the new season already. Um, so I wouldn't be, I know he can, he can offer some service in the midfield. So, and we've had a bit of injury there as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if he starts off at left back and starts doing really well that we see him getting integrated into the midfield uh, for AIC as well and giving us more, a bit more power and more stability there too. Of course, Hoi Safi and um, Karim and Saifar are both very important players for the national team, being around for many, many years. So going off that, um, what are the objectives for this season then? Well, unfortunately, AIC has his first objective. We've been kicked out of Europe already. We, um, we lost to the Bosnian team, Velez, um, on penalties. We would have gone through if the old the way goal rules um, stuck, but UEFA got rid of those, so we're out of that. So it's really um, minimum, you know, we'd want to try and win the Greek Cup and try and win the Greek Championship. The Greek Championship is going to be difficult. We've all got Olympiakos, Balk, um, and then you've got even Aris and Panathinaikos, who I'm sure are going to give us good competition. Um, uh, and, we, you know, uh, the, we've, we've got Hashafi coming in, um, with us now, and there could be some other transfers to make us a little bit stronger. So, it's really the cup and the championship. The cup is going to be a serious um, uh, goal for the for the club after what happened in Europe and disappointment there. And we're really going to want to have you know, give the the championship a, a really good uh, push. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens there because um, we've we've fallen behind Olympia course by a lot of points since we've won the championships. And the last couple of seasons, we've really fallen behind. So. We want to see a big boost there and be able to challenge Olympiacos for the championship again. It's excellent, Greg. I appreciate that. I appreciate the time. Um, hopefully we can have you on again next year. Hoping that Eson Hoi Safi and Kari Mansari Fard stay on. Uh, and maybe we even move some more uh, Iranians to the Greek League. And yeah, I appreciate the time. No worries, mate. Thank you very much. Asmun now with a shot. Asmun shoots and Asmun scores. It's an early goal for Zenit St. Petersburg, just under 10 minutes. Hi, my name is Sahan Solari. Today I'm joined by Andrew Flint, a Russian football expert, um, who's going to join us and uh, talk about uh, Sardar Osmoon, of course, our star forward who plays for Zenit St. Petersburg. Uh, Andrew, welcome to the podcast, and please introduce yourself. Well, thanks very much for, for having me on, guys. So, yeah, I, I've been based out here for about 11 years. Um, follow Russian Premier League very closely and the lower leagues where my local side are not so good. Um, but uh, I work for the Russian Premier League website and uh, Football Grand and Russian Football News. And stating the obvious, Sada Asmoon is the darling of Russian football. Um, and uh, we'll get into where we might end up in the near future. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And uh, okay, so I guess we can just start with a quick recap of last season um, for uh, Osmoon and also for Zenit. So obviously they won their um, league for the third time in a row, I think. And uh, yeah, they had maybe a substandard performance in the Champions League. So uh, if you want to just expand on that. Well, yeah, like you say, it was um, Zenit. Well, they, they weren't really challenged um, significantly at any point in the season. Um, they have the deepest resources, as many people know. Um, and they were uh, they were they ran away with it because of the goals that they scored. They broke the record for goals scored in the Russian Premier League. Asmund himself was on track to be the top goal scorer in the league again until the last day of the season when the title had already been wrapped up and Artyom Juba scored four goals on the last day. 
Um, but yet again, it's very hard to see anybody realistically challenging them for the title this season. Uh, they won their opening game. Asmund scored the first goal of the season for them, predictably. But on current form, very, very difficult to beat Zenit. Um, the next frontier for them, as you alluded to, is Europe, where they've massively underperformed. So high hopes we've got for them this season. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, back to uh, Zenit, uh, I guess, really in the Champions League. I mean, obviously, their objectives for this season, one would assume, are retaining their Russian Premier League title. That looks like it's becoming sort of like a monopoly for them at this point. But um, what do you think are the objectives in the Champions League? Well, I mean, they, there's nothing left for them to achieve domestically. They've, they've proven that they are a well, head and shoulders above the competition. Um, so it's not really proving much by simply winning the league again. Well, it is an impressive feat um, to win three in a row. Nobody's done it since Sparta at Moscow in the 1990s. Um, and the Champions League, they last season, it was a, it was a frustrating campaign. Um, losing at home to Club Brugge was a massive disappointment. They dominated the game, but just, just couldn't... They couldn't find the confidence, I think it is. I think it's... it's They're used to being big fish in a small pond to then being average-sized fish in a very big pond. It's a totally different atmosphere. Um, Borussia Dortmund were just a, a, a class above. Um, but Lazio, I felt like they were there for the taking. And again, it was just a lack of... A lack of perhaps continental know-how, you know, expertise, how to close out a game. Um, ambitions absolutely has to be to get out of a group stage. And it's getting a bit embarrassing for a club of their size, resources and playing squad. You know, it's not like a great shake-up is, is needed to do better than they've done so far. Um, I'd say quite comfortably they are a better side than last season Club Brugge. Um Benfica, definitely a better side than them. We should be doing better than them. They lost away from home the season before. And yet the last time they actually made any ground at all uh, in the Champions League was something like six, seven years ago. Um, uh, so they have to get out of the group stage, absolutely have to. But at the same time, they're clearly not going to win the competition. So I would say qualification from the group stage would be would constitute success, um, but they have to keep doing it because the club of their size, they can't just keep being knocked out at the group stage. So that's what I'd say the ambitions are, um, and they need to build on it from there. Okay, thanks for that. And, uh, okay, so now I guess we'll just pivot away and discuss the uh, potential move for Osmoon. I mean, he's highly rumoured to be on the move this summer, and uh, some news that was broken by some reputable Italian journalists uh, regarding interest from Bayer Leverkusen and Roma. That seems to have developed in the past week, and now German sources are reporting that he's very close to actually uh, finalizing a move to Leverkusen, as it seems was uh, a little bit out of Roma's price range, and they opted for, ironically, Osmund's uh, replacement at Rostov, the Uzbek striker Eldor Shomarudov. Um, could you just uh, talk to us a little bit about those potential moves, especially the Leverkusen one, and also Osmund's uh, contract situation, I guess, in general? He's on an expiring contract. Uh, seems mm -hmm. like Zenit have offered him a new one. Is he ignoring that or... Is there a chance he'll accept it? Well, it's been a it's been a very very surprising situation in my eyes that it's that Zanita have left themselves in this position um, with his with his contract. It's been very little talk about a contract offer until the interest from Roma and Leverkusen came about, which says to me it's a almost a sign of desperation as much as anything. Um, I don't think Zanita are under any illusions that that Asmoon is going to stay forever for the rest of his career in St. Petersburg. He's already given them um, two and a half very, very successful years. So it's not as if he hasn't um, earned the right for a bigger move. Um, and the thing to remember is about, especially about Russian football in general, is that any interest from, you know, big European leagues is seen as a major positive instead of sadness that we're losing a great player, which of course it is a great player that we'd be losing. Um, you know, R Russian clubs and managers understand that players will, if they are at the top of the Russian Premier League, they will want to take that chance. Now, in terms of the interest from 
uh, Roma, like you mentioned, it's uh, I, th- I believe it's going to be announced today or tomorrow about Shomorodov. Um, <laughs> and, and like you say, the irony of him coming in to Rostov. Um, a move to the Bundesliga would be fantastic. And I actually think Leverkusen would be a very good club for him. Um, he would find it a challenge uh, in that squad uh, with Patrick Schick. He had a good, uh, good Euros. Um, and they have the likes of Lucas Alario, but I think he's got the quality. I definitely think he's got the level to compete in that squad. Um, so um, at this point, um, from what I've read about the update on his contract, um, the interest shown and the moves other clubs are making in Russia, I'd probably say it's above 50-50. Um, but we have had interest in him before and it has passed by, he stayed. Um, and I was delighted at the time, but I think now is the right time to go. Uh, he's, he's 26 years old. He's, he's, well, obviously his international career is, is absolutely flying as well, scoring goals for fun. Um, his stock is very high. If you need to have another disappointing European campaign, perhaps clubs will start to think, well, hang on a minute. You've had three years there now. You've not done anything in Europe. Are we really interested? Or have you got that determination to make it at our club? And I think he'll know that. Okay, Andrew Flint, thank you for joining us. We could talk for a long time, but uh, I think we'll have to cut this one off now. And uh, best of luck to you covering the latest season uh, in Russia and hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Pleasure. Okay, we are joined by Burchu Eken uh, from Turkey. Uh, how are you doing, Burchu? Hi, Arya. Thank you very much for interview. Greetings from Turkey to everyone who is listening to us here. As you know, we live in a uh, busy period, new transfers, outgoing players, Olympic games, brilliantly less sleep, more work. <laughs> yeah, exactly the same. So we're here to speak about uh, Majid Hosseini, um, played last season for Trabzonspor. How do you think he, he played last season? Majid had a good time at Trabzonspor. He proved himself in Turkish football. He is a very successful defender. Uh, Trabzonspor wanted to new contract with him, but he chose to consider new offers, uh, Kayseri Spor. And obviously now he signed uh, for Kayseri Spor. How do you think he will play for them this season? Kayseri Spor is forming a new team this season. Uh, they work with a coach who wants to be successful. Therefore, Majid will be successful. He will a good season. I think it. Yeah, we, we hope so. We hope so. And of course, joining him um, at Kayseri Spor is uh, Ali Karimi. Um, they seem to be building a new team for the new season. How do you think he will do? Uh, Kayseri Spor is signed a two years deal with uh, Ali Karimi. He passed the hat check. He's okay. I hope he will be successful in Kayseri. And uh, the last two years have been bad for Kayseri Sport. Like I said a while ago, they are forming a new team this season. The president, Mrs. Berna Gözbaşı, promised to have a good season. I believe they will have a successful season. Yeah, we hope so. We hope so. Thank you very much for coming on uh, Global Zan podcast. You're welcome, Arya. Possibility of marking cara cara with Amir. Chitni. Autoriza o árbitro Rui Costa. Chitni. Bate Alex Santos defende Amir grande defesa. Hi, hi all. This is uh, Samson Tamajani. I'm joined uh, by uh, a fan uh, based in the UK of Bonfredina. That is the Liga Segunda uh, Division uh, team that uh, goalkeeper Abizade joined over the summer. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining. You're welcome. Thanks for the invitation. So, t- tell me a little bit about this team, uh, Ponferradina. It's it's ba- based in in, in Spain. Uh, it's one of I, it, if if you're outside of Spain uh, and especially if you're an Iranian fan, it might be one of the lesser known. Take our listeners through through uh, to, uh, all the details about this team and and uh, how they've been as of late. Okay, so Ponferradina are a club in Castile and Leon region of Spain, in the northwest of the country. It's about five hours uh, by train from uh, Madrid, the capital of Spain. Um, as a football club, we've only been in the second tier for nine years in our history. 
most recently coming up in 2019. Um, we actually finished the season in eighth place last season, uh, which is our third highest ever finish. Um, and the season before, we were in the top eight until the last eight games. Unfortunately, we lost seven of those to sink into a bit of a relegation fight, only surviving on the penultimate weekend of a very nervy end of a 2020 season. But uh, this last season has been much better and um, we're celebrating our centenary year this year. We turn 100 in June 2022. So there's a lot of celebrations in happening in, around the club and it's, um, it's a good and exciting time to be part of Bomfordina at the moment. And, and Chris, uh, if, uh, if I may ask, uh, how, how does an Englishman like you become a fan of, of a bit of a smaller club, historically speaking, uh, like uh, Ponferdina? I've uh, travelled across the world and always watched football, but in 2011, I walked an old pilgrimage walk to uh, Santiago de Compostela, and Ponferrada is the last major city before there. Being a football fan, I saw the, the stadium lit up at night and uh, went to take a look. There was just something about the place that captured my heart. Um, and I went back the following year, started to follow the club's results. In 2014, I went to my first game and I've been hooked ever since. I was given a complimentary season ticket um, in the year we actually got promoted. And I've maintained that season ticket over the past two seasons. Uh, this week buying my one for 2021-22. Um, unfortunately, I obviously didn't get to see them at all in the flesh last season because of the COVID pandemic. But um, I'm looking forward to going out as soon as we can. Um, I am based in the UK, as you said, but I still get, I got to 14 games in the 2019-20 season. So I still get out there quite often to watch the team. Now, in terms of the players, uh, you, you said how uh, uh, better in recent years that they, they're now in the second division. Uh, how does an addition like Abed Zadeh uh, help them? What have what, what impression do you think it's uh, making on on the, 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 your fellow supporters? We're really excited about the addition of Amir Abed Zadeh um, because um, at the end of last season, all three of our goalkeepers were out of contract. Um, so we don't have, didn't have a recognised number one going into the season. We have signed uh, Lucho Garcia from Deportivo La Coruña, who were a third tier team in Spain. And we've just signed yesterday um, a goalkeeper from Las Palmas, um, who used to, he came through the Barcelona youth system and played for Barcelona B. Um, but I, I think a Bedzida will um, stake a claim as the number one. He's a really exciting signing for Pompe. He's one that we've scouted a number of times. Um, as you know, he played in Portugal and Ponferrada is quite close to Portugal, just above the Portuguese border with Spain there. And um, he uh, came on as substitute yesterday in our first pre-season friendly. But um, what we've liked about Ponferrada recently is um, the goalkeepers were really close, not just a, a similar quality, but they got on really well. Uh, they pushed each other, were uh, coached by a former goalkeeper of the club in Omar Otero. And I really think that the goalkeepers' union almost stick together. And if Amir Abedzada buys into this and he works hard, in, uh, tra trains every day with the club and with his colleagues, he will improve as a goalkeeper. I know he has a wonderful pedigree, but Pomferrada are well known for their fantastic coaching, especially of the younger players. Um, and I think it's a real opportunity for him to stake a claim as a number one. We're so excited about what he did in Portugal. Um, he, he really seemed to, I mean, he was named in uh, in teams of the week in Portugal. He uh, fantastic finish, an eighth place finish for his club last season. Um, and um, I know how hard the club worked to buy him and convince him that Pomferrada was the place for him to learn and to continue his career. Um, and supporters also know of his father's pedigree, of course. So um, we're, we're looking forward to him settling down as as the number one come the first game of the season. Right. And, and the thing with uh, with uh, Amir is that many Iranian fans have noted is that 
Uh, he said that playing in La Liga is his dream, and he leaves Portugal to go to a second division team. Uh, and the impression that he has is that maybe uh, it's just a one-year stop to, in order for him to get up to the first division. But of course, there's always the possibility of of getting promoted yourself with uh, with this team. Is, is that kind of a hope that you have, uh, or are you maybe a little bit nervous? He might he may not want to stay that long. I have no doubt he will settle in the area. The people are really warm and friendly and um, welcoming to, to everybody. Um, I think that um, though the club may officially state that their aim is survival, um, the fact it is a 100th anniversary of the club, I really think we will have higher ambitions than that. It's perhaps um, an example of that ambition is that we're giving players on two or three year contracts including a bedsitter who um, has signed for at least two years with an option of a third. Um, and I don't see why not, uh, why we can't uh, push for those playoffs and maybe achieve La Liga status with him as our number one goalie, not just this season, but next season in the top flight as well. Chris, uh, I understand you're on Twitter. Could you uh, uh, tell us how to find you? Uh, my Twitter handle is at N-U-F-C-P-I-D-G-E. Um, NUFC Pidge. Um, that's betraying my um, origins in the north of England. Um, I'm a Newcastle United supporter, but um, I've, as I say, since uh, Pomfredina came into my life in 2011, I'm all blue and white now, and I'm looking forward to painting um, the museum to the club in my bedroom with a bit of green, white and red for my new Iranian hero. I think many will uh, be right there with you, uh, Chris. That's uh, Chris Pigeon, a uh, fan of Ponfaradina, and uh, that's, that's the squad that uh, Amir Abedzadeh will be playing for this coming season. Uh, Chris, uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. And the ball here to the edge of the box for Kabaev and Fabulov with the cross, and it's turned home. And would you believe it? It's the man fresh on, Syed Manesh, with his first ever European goal. Turn that in at the back post. Okay, uh, I'm joined by Andrew Todos from Zoria Londonsk. Uh, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me, Ariel. I appreciate you on your holidays just now, uh, taking the time to come on to Globazan. Um, just uh, give us a little bit about your, your own work with Zoria Londonsk. Well, I'm basically the, the source for Ukrainian football in English. So if anyone wants to find out anything about Ukrainian football, the league the national team, any sort of news connected to that, that's the place to go to find me. So Zoro Londonsk on Twitter, Instagram, also got a website, zorolondonsk.com. And I've also co-host a Ukrainian football podcast, which is also in English. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, check them out on social media. Okay, so let's ask you the first question then. Obviously, we have two players playing in Ukraine last season. Um we had Alayor Sayad Manesh, who obviously played in the Europa League as well, um, and also halfway through the season, um, coming from Olympic Donetsk, we had Shahab Zahedi, who moved to uh, Zoria as well. Um, how did they both play last season? How did Zoria get on? So, Alayor, he had a quite a good start to the campaign. He It took a while for him to get his debut, um, but once he did, he sort of hit the ground running. He got a, a memorable... Uh, a memorable first goal, a uh, nice counter-attack move um, in the UPL towards the end, I think it was against Alexandria. And then he sort of made the biggest name for himself when he scored the winner against Leicester, albeit it was in a Europa League group stage campaign that was more or less already over. But he stood out certainly for Zoria as one of their sort of leading flair attackers. And that was up until the winter break so it took a while for him to get going but once he did that was all good and then the winter break came which is from start of december all the way through to um mid february start of march and i think the second half of the season alakiara also had a good had a good second half he he got a few goals uh, going into sort of their cup final run where they reached the cup final um played pretty well uh leading up to that however Zoria lost in the final to Dynamo Kiev which was slightly disappointing um but overall he still made a made a name for himself in the 19 appearances that he had 
he got five goals and three assists. So, you know, for the return, and he wasn't starting every game either. Um, Victor Skipnik, the Zoria manager, likes to switch it up a lot. Um, so it's rather unpredictable whether he's going to play or not. Um, but overall, he, he impressed. Uh, a lot of pace, um, just quite working quite well with the, the counter-attacking, but also controlling style that Zoria wants to play, depending on what, what sort of opponent they're facing. Um, the biggest other performance that you can probably rem- I could probably remember of his is a, a famous memorable win against Shakhtar last season, which was a one 0 win. Um, he basically like ninety third minute he somehow had the energy to like run from his own from his own half all the way down to the Zoria box and uh, um, the Zoria, uh, the Shakhtar box and square it for Ivanisenia to score the winner uh, in a one 0 win. So in general, he, yeah, he certainly made a mark and he's staying there, I think, until at least either January or the end of next year. Um, I don't think that's confirmed yet, 100%. I'm not sure entirely how long or whether he might sign on a permanent deal or how that goes, but he's still on loan. His compatriot, uh, Zachary, he joined in uh, in January of last, well, um, February, March of last year. And he also had a, a bit of a diff, he had more of a difficult start to his career at Zoria. He had a bit of a big price tag for Ukrainian clubs. Um, he was like the top scorer for Olympic before he moved to Zoria. And he was like one of the top scorers in the UPL in general. Uh, he scored eight goals before the winter break. And then he joined the Zoria, where I think he scored in one of like his open few matches but in total in 12 appearances he only got two goals and he sort of it it, it looked like he was still needing a bit of time to gel in he wasn't fully um involved all the time from the start for Zoria he was getting like 20 minute cameos occasionally the same as I said for Alahia he was not not starting a lot of the lot of the time but looks like that is changing this season he's um got a couple of he's got a couple of starts so far um well th- three starts in all the games and you know hopefully just if he gets a bit more run in the sides they're playing they've got a, a few other um easier fixtures coming up once he gets running hopefully he can score and then just carry on in the stead that he had with olympic last season which we're still sort of waiting on for him to replicate at his new club Fantastic. Going into the new season, what are the objectives then uh, for both players and for the clubs? Well, it's this season in Ukrainian Premier League is like the last season where there's going to be like an automatic uh, Champions League spot if you win the league. I don't think Zoria are anywhere near Shakhtar or Dynamo to be challenging for the title as they have kind of done in the past couple of seasons maybe not gone for the title but certainly had the chance to finish in second but sort of blew it as, as the season ended um, for whatever reason and as a result this season they're definitely aiming to replicate another bronze place finish um, that will be their sort of main target for sure but then they've also got their Europa League playoff um, coming up so that will be a huge boost if they make it through to the group stage of the Europa League give the club much needed um, money and just helps them keep ticking over because Zoria is very much a buy or buy for very little amount and try and sell on for sort of bigger money very much a selling club so the immediate objective is going to be winning that Europa League playoff they've got rapid Vienna so if they can navigate past that And that'll be a positive. That'll be a good start to the season. If they don't win that, then they just drop into the Conference League group stages. And, you know, as we've seen in some of the results that have taken place in that, that's anyone's game at the moment. So who knows? But it looks like Alakiar and uh, Zakadi are, well, part and parcel of that because they've featured in all three games so far and looks like they're going to be involved going forward as well. Fantastic. Great to have you on, Andrew. Thanks very much for having me. Daar ligt de ruimte voor Jahan Baks. Die kan op weg naar de openingstreffer in deze wedstrijd. Jahan Baks en dat doet hij ook. Snelle goal Feyenoord. Ali Re 
Chiesa, ja aan Max. Prettig voor hem. Weer voetballer in Rotterdam. Nu ook doelpunten maken in Rotterdam. Sorry, I'm joined by Michael Statham, uh, who covers the Dutch league. Here to speak about uh, Coach Najar, who played for PSD Zwolle last season, and also Ayers Jan Bars, who's now moved to Feyenoord. Um, how are you doing, Michael? Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. How can the fans find you uh, on your on social media? I'm the I'm the number two, I suppose, um, in charge of Football Aranya, which is a Dutch football website in the English language. Uh, that's run by myself and somebody else. We cover the Dutch league, the Dutch national team on there. I also do some work for Pinnacle Sports, which is a betting website. Um, but yeah, anything Dutch football in the English language, I'm there. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay. Uh, so let's speak about the Iranians that played that play currently or played previously in the um, Dutch league. So Reza Gochonajad played for Zawala last season. Um, he's left now. He's a free agent uh, until something happens in the, in the transfer window. How did he play last season? Uh, Reza Gochonajad, he had a couple of years or a year and a half with Peck Zawala. He played towards the bottom end of the Eredivisie. Um, whenever he scored, it seemed to like come in bunches for him. He, I'm surprised a player of his quality didn't get more regular games, more regular minutes. But um, I, I just I just got the impression that he wasn't driven enough to play every week. Um, he's got the quality, but just wasn't really given the opportunity because of a few reasons. But I, I just think that some games he'd play really well and some games you just wouldn't see him. Right, exactly. Um, but... You know, he's been replaced now by Alice Jambach, another Iranian who um, previously was top goal scorer of the league uh, with AZ Altmar. Um, obviously went to Brighton and the Premier League. Didn't have a successful spell there, has to be said. However, he's come back. He's going to play for Feyenoord. Um, was it a surprise? I, mean, I know he's, he's replacing Berghaus. Obviously, they had to get a, a right winger to replace him. Was it a surprise for you? And what are the expectations? Yeah, Ali Reza Jahanbak, she's meant to be Berghaus's replacement. And I, I, I don't know quite how it's going to go yet, just because when he was in the Eredivisie, of course, he was excellent for Arzad Altmar, um, top goal scorer in the, in the Dutch league, and um, had a few tough years with Brighton. And where does he go from here? I think, I think it's just that he wants to play every game and be really important for finals, which is something that that club, club can offer him. What's, so what, 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 what would the expectations for him be then? Obviously, he's come in to replace a, a very, very good player, play, a guy who plays in the Dutch national team. Um, are they expecting him to do what he did at Akmar, or is he expected to be a little bit less than that? You know, what, what are his uh, objectives? No, it certainly is to try and replace what the Burkhouse's influence was, and that's a massive pressure on his shoulders, but not something that Jahan Bakshi is going to um, shirk away from because... I, I, I get the impression that he can do it and he can score goals in, in the Eredivisie. I, I don't see why not. He'll have a regular place in that right-hand side for the whole season. Um, and I think it's just giving a little, little bit of patience to the beginning, you know, settling back into the Dutch league and playing every week. But once that's out of the way, I think we need to expect that he can produce some of the form that he, he showed at, at RZ. I'm not saying he should be the top scorer in the Dutch league again, but he, um, he definitely has good quality off that right-hand side and they need someone to score goals and create goals and, and, and that pressure has to rely on him because of the, I guess, lack of quality around the final attack elsewhere. So, yeah, they, they want to they try and get the best out of him again. Yeah, can't wait to watch some of the matches. Can't wait to even go to the, to the stadium team even when we watch one of the matches. Um, I appreciate the time, Michael. Hopefully, we can have you on again next year uh, if Jahan Bach does stay on. Cheers, always a pleasure. I hope I got me. I hope I got Bliver presset her, Isaac Dullahi! Sikkel mål! Said, Isaac Dullahi! Okay, I'm joined by Kion Funudi, an uh, Iranian-Danish journalist based, of course, in Denmark. Um, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. Thank you for reaching out. Uh, thanks for coming on. Appreciate the time. Uh, can you give the listeners a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Yeah, sure. I... Uh... I uh, am, as you said, a uh, Iranian born. I was born in Tehran in 1984, and we moved to Denmark when I was about five years old. And then in 2010, I finished studying to become a journalist, and um, I really didn't know what to do at that at that point. And then uh, 
I was dreaming big and I moved to England without a place to live or a job. Uh, I just wanted to be a, a journalist reporting on, on, uh, on the Premier League. And uh, luckily there was a Danish player at that time, Christian Poulsen, who signed with Liverpool. I was living up in Liverpool and he signed with Liverpool. So uh, some of the Danish media reached, reached out to me and said, can you do some stuff about, about him and interview and, and interview the people there? And, and I did, and it just snowballed from there. And I was there for three years covering the Premier League for Danish TV. And uh, I came back and I was a host on the Premier League show for about three, three years. And uh, subsequently also uh, started following uh, as a reporter, the Danish national team. And then I didn't really do much uh, about the Danish league. league. Uh, and then when uh, Said uh, arrived in Baile, um, I, I talked to my editor about doing an interview with him. Obviously, it would be easier for me to do the interview because we would be speaking in Farsi and then we could translate it afterwards with subtitles. So we did that and had a great interview with, with him. Perfect. It's good to see you've also very close to Said as well. So that's what we're going to speak about uh, yourself. Give us your thoughts on Viola last season uh, and how Said fitted into that system uh, that they played. Well, last season, he was very lucky when he first arrived that the team uh, did really well. Uh, it was kind of a surprise because obviously they had uh, been promoted uh, the season before and... Uh, even though Baile historically is a big club, no one really had uh, high expectations, but they started really well and Said quickly adapted to kind of like a deep lying uh, playmaker role. Uh, obviously, he's a big guy, but his, I think everyone who's seen him play would say that his technique and the way he anticipates the game is kind of his forte, his, his um, what do you call it, forte. And uh, that was what he showed. And then... Um, Kind of going into the middle part of the season, um, uh, I think he had he had a, an injury which kept him out for a couple of days, and and after that until Christmas, I don't think he was I, he was not playing uh, his best. I, I spoke to him earlier today, and I would just wanted to corroborate it because that was my feeling. And then I asked him about it, and he said, "Yeah, I had some trouble getting over that injury um, that he had, maybe like 10, 15 games into the season." And, 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 and at that time, it, it didn't really go too well for Violet. The, the great start was kind of followed by a slump in form. And then they were, as people expected, kind of in that bottom region of the Superliga. Uh, and then after, after the, we have in Denmark, there's kind of like a winter break for about a month and a half, two months. And after the winter break, when the game started back in February, uh, Violet still had some tr uh, problems, but then, when the league was split, because we have in Denmark, we have this um, after 26 games, the league is split between the uh, top half and the bottom half. Uh, Vile uh, picked up again on the results and, and became third from bottom and the two the bottom teams go out, but they were like 12 points from the team under them. So they, they, they survived the league quite uh, comfortably in the end. And I think Said also picked up his game at the end of the season. Uh, ended up scoring, I think, four goals in total, which was quite quite good for a deep lying midfielder. He he, he had um, he had some games where he was more offensive, and you know, as you know, he's very good coming into the coming to the box. He has his physique, and and he has kind of, kind of an eye for goal. So um, I think it was in the uh, all in all, it was um, uh, an okay season. I mean, a, a very uh, not. Uh, not not perfect season, but still an acceptable, good season from him. Talking about his goals, he scored a fantastic screamer uh, that got, I think it was, goal of the season for them. And also, this is the first time Saeed has actually played more than 20 games in a season in his entire career. You know, because he struggled with injuries so much when he was at Russia. And he is struggling to, to get the game time. But this previous season, he did get that. So going into the new season... What are your thoughts for him? How does he now develop on that? I think the important the, the important thing is how he'll, will he adapt to the new system? Because uh, there's a new sheriff in town, I was going to say, a new coach um, who was actually the coach of one of the teams that went down. Uh, but uh, he became the new uh, violent manager after... Um, after they uh, didn't didn't extend the contract with uh, Galcha, uh, the Romanian who 
who was the coach when Said came uh, to begin with. And this new 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 manager is um, is thinking very differently than the previous one in terms of his philosophy. He's much more, uh, would you say, like a tiki taka kind of coach. Uh, uh, Guardiola in the Guardiola mold, the philosophy of him. He shares that. So it's it would be very much more high pressing uh, game. It would be very much more a, a, a combination, the short passing style that that they will adapt. Um, in in violin and the, the 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 interesting thing is how will first of all Saeed adapt to this um, and how will the team fare and I think one of the problem is it's a very very young team violet the the current violet team and looking at the players that brought in I I'm I'm, I'm struggling to see the real quality there uh, uh, so I think it's going to be a tough season really to be honest yeah for sure. For sure, and on the unknowns, there's also um, an Iranian, um, Danish player playing in, in the same team as Said. He uh, goes by the name of Valdemar Sadrifar. Um, so keep an eye on him if he keeps on this season. Maybe he'll he'll get into the youth national teams for Iran. Definitely, uh, yeah. He played his first game this this weekend when they lost two 0 to uh, Iran. That's a really good good team. So I'm yeah. I'm, lo- I'm I'm looking forward to kind of following this guy's uh, progress. For sure. Uh, Kian, I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. No worries. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm joined by Ahmed Hashim from Qatar Football Live. Welcome to Golbazan Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. So, uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, Qatar Football Live and how people can find you on social media? Thank you, Kian. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here uh, on the podcast. My name is Ahmed. I am from Qatar. I'm actually from India, but I was born and raised in Qatar, and I've been following football in Qatar for quite some time now. And um, I'm the co-founder of Qatar Football Live. Uh, we are a social media platform. We try to promote and cover Qatari football in English. And we've been doing that for, for the past two years on Twitter and Instagram. And our handle is at QFootLive uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Okay, wonderful. So we were going to ask you about uh, the Iranian players in the QSL. Last season, we had seven. So let's start with Al Arabi which had uh, Mertad Mohammadi and Mehta, uh, Mehdi Torabi until a uh, half season. So how do you think they performed? Well, uh, I think Mehrdad Mohammadi was, uh, was a very good signing for Al Arabi in terms of his impact. And although they didn't quite achieve what they wanted to uh, in the league or even in the cup, so it wasn't quite the finish that they wanted. But uh, I think Mohammadi was uh, was a very good signing for them. He scored goals and uh, he scored some really wonderful goals, uh, which I think uh, one of his bi- I think the bicycle kick winner against Um Salal could be uh, a contender for the goal of the season. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Mehdi Torabi didn't have a similar impact uh, when he came in. Um, there was quite a bit of hype because he was uh, he was highly uh, rated uh, during his time with Persepolis. But uh, when he arrived in Doha, he had some issues, injury problems, I think, which affected his form. And uh, although I think he tried his very best, it just didn't work out for him. And uh, Al-Arabi have this habit of changing their foreign players every once in a while. They haven't been stable in that department. So it wasn't quite, uh, it wasn't that big of a surprise when they uh, let him go. So um, that's how they ended the season. So Mehdi Torabi was there only for a very short period. And uh, I think it's, uh, for me, I think personally, uh, I'm sad to see him go because I had a lot of expectations for him. But at least Mohammadi is there and uh, he has been really good. And I hope to see him uh, impressed in the next season as well. Yeah, that's right. Especially about the, um, the foreign players. They had, um, I believe, Ashkan Dejaga and Javad Nekunam there uh, quite a few seasons ago, too. So uh, let's move on. How did uh, Ruzbe Cheshmi do for Um Salah? Ruzbe Cheshmi came in from Istiglal. He had um, he had a great reputation. 
and he was there partnering Ayman Abdel Noor in, in defense, which I think was a very good pairing. And they both managed to help Um Salal uh, survive in the league, escape from relegation. But apparently, that's not good enough for the for the management. And uh, I think he enjoyed his time here, from what I've seen. But uh, he's been let go, and they've gone for another option for the next season. Uh, I don't know what's uh, what's happening in terms of uh, in terms of his plans for where he's going to next, but uh, I think he did pretty well given the uh, you know circumstances that he found himself in because Umsalal was struggling. They had seen so many changes in the team. It wasn't a stable team, and uh, they were in a very bad position. But uh, I think they were solid at the back when he came in and after he came in. So uh, I'm surprised to see him. So I'll let him go. To be honest. Yeah, it looks like he's uh, might be on his way back to Iran too. Um, so the next player we're going to ask about another defender, uh, Shoja Khalilzade, who signed from Persepolis to Al Rayyan. Uh, what do you think about him? Khalilzade, in, in my book, Shoja Khalilzade is like the superstar signing. Uh, in terms of all the uh, players who've come in in the, the midway point last season. And uh, there was a lot of excitement, obviously, because we've all seen Persepolis uh, and how they've played in the Champions League, and he was at the heart of that team. So there was a lot of excitement from Al Rayyan fans when he came in. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, a lot of the, the expectation was that they could build a strong team to compete in the Champions League, but that didn't happen for them. Because it's not just about Khalil Zad. Uh, they were not able to build the team, uh, you know, and strengthen the team in all the departments. So uh, you have some big names like Yasin Brahimi and Khalil Zada, but that's not enough, uh, especially, especially in terms of the Qatari players. The Rayan are not uh, good enough, and even their squad depth is not uh, enough or appropriate you know, to go and compete in Asia against the very best teams. So um, Khalil Zada had the opportunity to play in those Champions League games back-to-back in a centralized format. I think it was very difficult for them to play there in uh, in Goa, uh, difficult conditions. Uh, but uh, he managed to score a goal. But, but in, overall, the campaign was very bad for Rayan. But I think he, uh, he's he been accepted by the fans for his uh, performances. And they're all excited to see what can happen next season. Uh, they're still not strengthened anywhere. They have not bought any other players. So I'm not sure if, if, if Rayan can, you know, be a contender for the league title next season. But uh, anyway, Khalil Zada will, will remain in the club and uh, we need to wait and see how his season will turn out. All right, so let's ask about uh, Ali Karimi now. Uh, Ali Karimi signed for Qatar SC and then he was, I think, very quickly loaned out to um, Al Duhail where he played in the Club World Cup too. So how did, uh, how did he do? Well, that was a, it's a bit of a surprise for me because uh, Ali Karimi came in uh, the summer of 2020 and uh, I think he was, a, he was a good signing for them. He started well with the team. They, they competed for the top four and suddenly at the midway point, he's being loaned out of the head. And uh, everyone in Qatar knows uh, what's happening in terms of uh, the head getting the place they want, you know, because... Uh, they are a highly influential club and uh, they have the money as well. So they were going to the FIFA Club World Cup campaign in December, uh, in February. So they wanted to change some of the players. They wanted to get an Asian player in instead of Ramin Razayan. So that's why they brought in Ali Karimi. And then I heard that Ali Karimi could move to Al Garrafa. And uh, obviously there was another Stiglal figure at the club because uh, Andrea Stramaccioni joined the club as manager, but um, it didn't turn out that way and he went to Turkey. But I think he was a really, really great player. He had a, a delightful uh, touch and uh, he was uh, very calm. And I think that's the kind of player that I would like to have in my team. Yeah, like you mentioned, it looks like Ali Karim is headed to Kayseri Spor in Turkey. And uh, since you mentioned Ramin Rezaian at uh, Al Duhil, a lot of people in Iran were surprised to not see him invited to the national team uh, camps the last few uh, the last few games so he's had quite a he's had quite an adventurous uh, few seasons in Qatar I'd say uh, 
signed for Al Shahania and was, I think he was their star player. He was all over the field for them. He played defense, midfield, even uh, forward in a few of their games. He scored uh, quite a lot of goals and um, that earned him a move to Al Duhail where he played a few games and then he got loaned to Al Salia. So uh, how do you rate his performances? Uh, last year, last season, we made uh... Our, we selected our picks for the team of the season and uh, you know there was a sure pick for uh, a right back position and that was Ramin Razaya after what he did with uh, Shahania last season uh, the 2019-20 season uh, he was a literal machine and uh, it was only a matter of time until the big teams came calling so when Shahania were relegated it was sure that uh, someone would come and uh, you know want to get him al Duhail did exactly that but uh, it didn't really turn out very well for him at the hill because uh, that's a club with a lot of expectations and a lot of pressure on every player. So when you went into when you go into that kind of a team, you need to perform at the highest level, and he couldn't. I don't know if it's because of the the coach's tactical setup and because he wasn't given the kind of freedom that he was given at uh, Shahania, where he literally he was the heart of the team. Then. He, along with his um, Iraqi teammate, Muhammad Ali, they were both loaned out to Al-Saliya. And uh, I think Al-Saliya hit the jackpot when they got both Muhammad Ali and Ramin Dazayan because uh, here are two international players. I think you could say that they were among the best players in Asia and they got them on loan from Al-Duhil. And they made the best use of that. And you could see that both players... Uh, ended up uh, revitalizing, you know, the, the season, and uh, they ended up winning two titles: the QFA Cup and also the Oridu Cup. Which uh, I think, you know, it's funny because I mean, went to a club like El Duhel and he couldn't win anything, and then he goes to Al Sali and then he wins two titles. So Al Sali was very keen to keep them on, and uh, last week they announced that they would uh, they would extend the loan agreement of Ramin. All right, now let's move on to uh, Omid Ebrahimi. He, he's been in Qatar for, I think, two seasons now. He was loaned out to, uh, to Belgium, to UPenn for one season. But um, he's, he's been pretty good for Al Ahli from what we've heard. And he's recently uh, moved to Al Wakra, which came as a surprise to all of us. So uh, what do you make of that move? It was very surprising for me as well, because I think if you take all the five foreign players that were there at Al Ahli last season, uh, I think Omid Ibrahimi was the most influential. And the season that he went to Belgium, that was a season in which Al-Ahli struggled. And the moment he came back, it was like they were a different team. You know? They were like transformed. And uh, I think in the initial weeks of the season, they were top of the table. We haven't seen that for a long, long time. There was a genuine excitement among uh, the Al-Ahli fans who who haven't even come to the stadium, you know, for a long time. And then they were all very excited because of the team's transformation. And I think Omid Ibrahimi had a very, very big role to play in that. I, I thought he would stay, but they made the decision not to continue with him. Once he left, it wasn't surprising that any, another QSL club would want him because they all have seen what he can offer. And uh, al Wakra is also, I think they have a similar profile compared to Al-Ahli, their former uh, champions of the league and uh, they have, they're trying to regain their past glories and uh, this is the kind of player who you need in, in your midfield, you know. So I'm looking forward to seeing how, how he performs for Al-Wakra. Uh, it's a very good signing for them. Let's move uh, on to Hossein Kanon Izadagan. He hasn't played yet for uh, any Qatari team, but he's signed recently for al Ahly. So what do you, how do you think uh, Hossein Kanon will do at al Ahly? I think... Uh, Hussein Kanani is, I think, uh, a very, very exciting signing as well because uh, he's part of that uh, the memorable Persepolis team. And now we have both Kanani and uh, Khalid Zadeh in Qatar. I haven't followed uh, Kanani's career that much, but uh, I know that uh, after he he reached the Champions League final with uh, Persepolis, there would uh, there would definitely be a lot of interest in him from the Qatari clubs and. Uh, it's surprising that it's Al-Ahli who has, uh, who has got him, but it's also not, not a big surprise considering the history with Iranian players. I'm looking forward to watching him as well. Yeah, so uh, Ahmed, I was also going to ask you about uh, Pejman Montazeri. He played for uh, Al-Kharaitiyat. I think he signed for them when they were in the second division. I may be wrong. 
and he promoted with them. So how do you think he performed in the QSL? Uh, Pejman Muntazari, I think uh, it's a great, great example to talk about uh, because he was there with uh, Al Khalid when when they were in the second division, and then he got them promoted to the the Qatar Stars League. And last season, we saw them get uh, relegated once again. So I I just uh, got the confirmation from, from their site that they've retained uh, Pejman Muntazari for the next season. That means they trust him. And even though he's, uh, I think he's, he's 37 years old, even though uh, he's at that age, they, they really, really want him to continue with, uh, with them. And uh, the second division is not, that big of a problem for a player like him and uh, I wonder if he manages to win promotion with them for a second time so let's uh, let's wait and see yeah that's right thank you so much Ahmed for your uh, for coming on the podcast and for your insightful analysis thank you thank you Kian for the opportunity it was a pleasure and uh, I'm looking forward to the next season là il y a occasion parce que Golizade est sur son pied gauche Golizade pour l'ouverture du score all right, hi guys, this is uh, editor Samson Tamajani. I'm joined now by someone who we've had on before. We brought him on last year to talk about the Team Elite players who were Belgian-based. Maxime, uh, thank you for your time today. Hi guys, very happy to, to, to be back in the team uh, this year, and I hope you, everything is well for you. Yeah, we, we had you on last year. Uh, can, can you remind us how we can, uh, how, who you write for and how we can find you on social media? Yeah, I'm, I'm writing for um, a newspaper called uh, La Dernière Heure Les Sports. It's uh, a Belgian newspaper in the, in the French part of Belgium and is the, well, the biggest newspaper about sports in, in, the, in the French part of Belgium. And you can find me on, on social media on the Maxime Jack is, uh, is the name of the of the account, and I'm sharing any any news about the Belgian Pro League and the Team Melly players. And we have plenty of Belgian-based players uh, to talk about. Uh, two of uh, Iran's uh, better offensive players. One's a starter. One is uh, consistently uh, maybe a backup behind the two main playmakers of Mehdi Tarami and Sardar Azmoun. Uh, and that's uh, Kabe Razai, but also uh, attacking midfielder Ali Khulezadeh. Uh, they both play for Charleroi. Can you give us a update on how last season went for them and, and what's being expected of them uh, this season? Any any moves? First, I will I will start with Kabe Razai. Um, he was on loan on loan from from Club Bruges in Charleroi last year. He had a very good beginning of the season, uh, but. Uh, at the beginning of 2000, 2021, it was not, not that easy for him with some injuries, with some lack of confidence. Only one goal uh, this, this year. So uh, came back in, in Bruges l- l- last summer and, and a few days ago he's, he has signed for OHL. A new team uh, who get promoted uh, in the Belgian Pro League two years ago. and But a team that has been very consistent last year and played nearly uh, with, the, with the best team and uh, he will have to to replace uh, uh, the number nine called Thomas Henry who will leave the club so Kave Rezai will be the, the number one striker in that team uh, this season. You wouldn't say that move you wouldn't say that move is a surprise would you? Well I, I'm not surprised that uh, he's staying in Belgium but uh, I'm a bit surprised that he will play for OHL because uh, you know that, that that's uh, a team with uh, the reputation of, of OHL is minder that that Charleroi. You know, it's a step back for Cave if you want. But uh, if he's the if he is the number one number one striker, and if is the team is playing the same football than last year, it can be a, a step forward. It will depend on how the season is going. And then with Ali uh, Golazade. Uh, do you think uh, he would make a move or stay with Charleroi? Well, we had an interview with him so, some days ago. He was uh, feeling very happy in Charleroi. I, I think it's not a problem for him to stay, but if he can make a, a step forward, he will do it definitely. Um, some talk have, have been made with, with Nantes in, in France. It will not be a, a surprise to, to see him go, go to Nantes, but uh, he has some uh, value 
at the moment call is that you know last season was his third season in Belgium it was very really good the best season so far for him and uh, obviously when he's in shape is one of the best player in the league with that left foot with the technique it was uh, really really uh, enjoy he was enjoying his, his football and we were enjoying uh, watching him in, in play so I think that was a really good season for him and personally I hope that he will stay in Belgium because he's uh, one of our um, attractive players um, on, on, on the league but it will be a, it will be a, a great step for him to go to, to France and I think if he goes to Nantes he will be uh, very quick to, to adapt and to, and to be uh, in the starting 11 in Nantes. Yeah, he certainly earned himself as a reliable starter with the Iranian national team uh, as well. A different story with uh, Milad Mohammadi. Uh, he's played for Ghent uh, recently. Uh, do you have any update on him, whether he's moving or or um, how uh, he's been for them? Well, he will move because it's the uh, objective of the club and the, of the player. Um, he's not in the in the squad for the moment. You know, the, the season uh, started uh, three weeks ago in Belgium, and uh, Milad Mohammadi was never in the in the Ghent squad. He's not. Uh, in the Conference League squad, also uh, the, the the coach did not include him, so that's a, a, a big sign. And uh, his wages um, is a, a problem for Gen, so they, they want him to uh, to go abroad. And I, I think England should be a, a good choice for him due to his style of play. You know, he was former season was mixed feelings, so some good games, some bad games. Uh, some assists. Some he'll, sometimes I think he, he lose the ball too easily, but he's a uh, he's great to watch. Uh, personally, I, I like this kind of player. But Gaint don't want him anymore because they have bought um, a new left back. So I think Milad Mohamadi will find a solution in the in the next few few days. So I think it will be a um, a move in England with no with no with no fee. Uh, lastly, uh, last player I want to ask about is, uh, of course, the goalkeeper, Ali Reza Baron He made the move uh, from Antwerp to uh, Portugal. Uh, did, did, was, was Antwerp sad to see him go? No, because, uh, you know, his, his first season, and I think his only season in Belgium, was not that good. Um, when he played, he was, he was clearly uh, missing some confidence. He made some huge mistakes during his first games. And, you know, the, that, that was it. Uh, Antwerp is a team uh, playing the top of the league. We want to have so, someone uh, very consistent uh, as a goalkeeper. And they, they also had bought, bought uh, uh, another goalkeeper, a French one, Jean Buté from Moucron, a young player. And when Buté has played, he was better than Beran Van. So I'm not surprised that Ali Reza Beran Van is not in Belgium anymore. But I will not be surprised if he succeeds in, in Portugal. Well, in terms of the the clubs that uh, most Iranians pay attention to in Belgium, obviously it's going to be Charleroi once again. Uh, how do you uh, foresee uh, Charleroi doing this season? Uh, for the moment, uh, the, they've made a good start of, of the season with a new coach, a young coach with uh, attractive football. You know, uh, last season was the beginning was very good, and then physically they c- collapsed completely because th- that was. Always the, the same starting eleven, and um, the coach uh, Karim Belosin start to play very defensively, uh, and that that was just not good. And the, the end uh, of the season was just a, just a mess. Um, but this season with the the new coach, some new players, very interesting ones uh, in defense, uh, uh, in attack also. The 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 Mercato has been really uh, interesting and. I think that this season will be a good one for Charleroi if they can find a new striker because they need a, a new striker. You know, Caveretza is gone, so they need uh, to replace him. That's not uh, the case for the moment, but the rest of the team is very consistent. So I think that Charleroi will play maybe top four or top eight. You know, we, we play playoffs at the end of the season. I think they, they will definitely play to one of the two players. He is Maxime Jacques, very uh, reliable. Uh, and friend of the show, uh, and you can find him on Twitter at Maxime Jacques. We'll tag him in our social media post. Maxime, thank you for joining us once again. 
Thanks to you guys. For, uh, my pleasure. Thanks everyone for listening. Hope you enjoyed the analysis from all the journalists around the world. We appreciate their time greatly. Bear in mind that we did record these within the last three weeks, so things may have changed. Anything that has changed, we will cover in part two of this episode coming out next week, having our own discussion regarding the Legionnaires. Be sure to follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts and all the other podcast platforms as well as following all the journalists and experts all the links down below we'll be back very very soon take care My name is Saida Zatulay and you're listening to the Golbezan podcast.